Okay, so um, last time we talked about KLT Tracker, uh, which is a um, pretty popular uh, tracker um, uh, used a lot. As I told you, it uh, started with um, Lucas Canade, um, optical flow algorithm, which actually started from computing depth using these two stereo images. So the reason it's called KLT is Canade, Lucas, and Tomasi was another um, <coughs> PhD students of Canade. Um, and uh, so the simple um, tracker, as I understand, is that you detect Harris corners points, and you have learned that how to do that, which involves the derivative of images, the fx, fy, and um, computing this matrix and finding eigenvalues and deciding whether there is significant um, um, corner there. And then we are going to basically track these corners. So this is related to you know several points on each object. But if you just want to track one point or just target, you can do that also. So for each Harris corner, we compute the motion between two consecutive frames. So that's the main point here, and that's the um, gist of this. And that you can compute using the alignment between two frames. As you've been talking about, is alignment, registration, global motion, and lots of different uh, terms, and, but it means the same thing. And uh, then once we have alignment between two frames, then we want to take a point, um, um, the corner point, say x, y, in the first frame, and uh, find out where it goes in the next frame because we have alignment, we have the transformation. We can transform any point in the first frame to the point in the second frame. So that gives you the next location uh, of that point, and that basically you can link, you can say this position, this position, you can link them and that gives you a track. And um, you can continue tracking those, or uh, you can introduce some more corners, and after a few frames, detect more corners. And um, then keep tracking these, using these steps from two to four, the old and new, new corners. Okay, so that's the simple uh, KLT uh, tracker algorithm. Now, in that thing, the main thing was this alignment, that how we can find this alignment of two uh, images or two pages. This, this is the one image, and this is a template. And this was a simplified algorithm by Simon Becker and others. And the main point here is that we will take this um, image and we will uh, warp it with the initial estimate we have for this alignment. We will then have a template. We will um, subtract from the template, which we'll bring in here, and also find the gradient of the template. From there, we will have also Jacobian, and using these gradient, we will compute these images. And using these and this difference, then we'll compute Hessian, and combining all this thing, we'll come up with the, the change in the parameter vector, which is delta p. And we will keep doing that several times until there's not much change, and we'll stop there. So it's a iterative method to compute this alignment. And these steps, which are shown in the pink, are done only once. And that will save a lot of computation. The, the steps, which are done iteratively, are shown with the blue. And this is basically just warping, that we keep warping this image depending on the new estimate we get. And then we go through that loop. And this is, as we talked about, this is basically the same approach which we had discussed uh, in Bergen, Adel's method to compute a fine transformation, in which you are going to implement also. And here also we mention that um, uh, if the motion is large, then we do have to use a pyramid. But this assumes, since it's a video, um, from frame to frame, the motion may be small, so we should be able to do without pyramid in many cases. Okay, so today we are going to talk about another popular tracker, which is called mean shift tracker. Okay, and um, this um, is also very simple, 
and I have shown you the results obtained by this kind of tracker. So these are the infrared imagery. These videos are taken from a missile and we want to track this particular target where the camera is moving. We want to keep keep aiming at this, that target even there is a lot of uh, motion, a lot of zooming in, zooming out and so on and that is the tracking obtained by mean shift kind of method. Now you know, at the end it uh, kind of drift away but it was able to track for quite long, long time. So the question is how can we do that? How can we write a program at the end of this lecture, you can go home, write a program, basically, which will do that, which, which is you know, pretty good. So um, this is another typical result from mean shift tracking. So here we have a soccer game, and um, we are tracking this particular player. And this player track is shown in the green, and we want to keep track of this guy wherever he goes. And now actually we missed it and then we started again. We are showing this red track for this person. And um, ultimately we would like to actually track all the people in this kind of um, uh, sports. So this is another example of mean shift results and I'll show you more at the end of the lecture. So, so we have this window on that person and we want to find the center of the window how it's going at every frame and we connect these centroids and becomes track which is shown in the green. Okay, so um, this lecture uh, combines uh, uh, three presentations. Um, there is a nice presentation from Doran Kaminich and uh, his advisor um, that those were the authors they proposed this mean shift uh, method um, in, a, in a paper in PEMI in 2002 and that paper is again a very highly cited paper, it's about 5,000 citations and then there's a presentation by my former students who is a professor at Ohio State, Alper Yilmaz and then there's a presentation by my current student Afshin so this is a combination of these several presentation uh, to try to explain this in very very intuitive level and very clearly. As you have noticed that these days <coughs> there's a lot of material available on, on the web and many people put presentations, PowerPoint, PDFs and so on and it's very convenient for all of you to actually get those and learn and understand. Uh, so you know uh, there's a um, quote from Bill Gates, it's a best university these days is the internet because internet has all these you know great material available from all these famous professors famous researchers there and you can you know explore those and you can uh, you can learn these things very quickly even the videos and so on but there's always <coughs> um, you know some danger there because people have tendency to you know copy these presentations, the slides and images and then mix together in the presentation. Sometime we miss to give a credit, proper credit, who originally, you know, made this presentation or generated those. So I may be guilty of that because it's very difficult to keep tracking of, you know, like I got a presentation from Alper but maybe he found some slides from somebody else and then he found from someone else and so on. But the the intention is good that, you know, we want to um, do this for education purposes, so I hope, you know, uh, we will be okay. Okay, so this is the mean shift uh, theory and the applications. So the idea is that we have these um, billiards um, balls, these are the points, um, and these points are in 2D, you know, each point has X and Y location. And we want to find the densest region of this, you know, this distribution. So, so where is a dense area? Among all the area, dense areas, we want to find the region which is very dense. Okay? So we will we have some initial estimate. We we'll, if you don't know, we just randomly start. So well, uh, the region of interest is here, and that centroid of this is that that's the location where it's a 
the most dense. So then we will um, find the center of mass, um, which is like a centroid. We'll take these points, we add them up, and divide by number of points will give you a center. Okay? And this is in every circle, it's, you know, it's just a center of mass. And uh, so that will give you a vector from the previous um, uh, estimate to the center of mass, and that vector basically is called mean shift vector. Because finding a mean and shifting that, and that vector shifts that. Okay? So, so this is the distribution of identical billiard bars, as I told you, we can consider that. And our goal is to find this, the densest region. So start with some initial interest. We find the center mass, we shift there. Then again, we look at the, um, we, we shift there, and then we again have this uh, region of interest. Then we find the centroid again, and then we shift there. And then we keep doing that. Find again the centroid, move that, and like that. Okay? So that process is giving us the mean shift vector, how the mean is shifting. And once it converges, then that that's, is the region where we have the densest set of points. So mean shift vector, um, the way it works that we are given data points and approximate location of the mean of this data, we want to estimate the exact location of the mean of data by determining the shift vector from the initial estimate. And we will do this iteratively until we don't have to move, until we do. mean shift vector is zero, basically. Okay, so suppose, you know, this is our set of data points and this is our starting point and we compute this mean shift vector. The way we are going to compute, we will find the mean of these points. These are the points x1, x2, up to xn. We sum them up and they are vectors, in this case, two-dimensional vector, but they can be any dimensional vector. And um, so there are nx of them. We sum them up, we divide by the nx number of points and we subtract from it the initial estimate y0. And that vector is called mean shift vector. Okay? So that mean shift vector essentially will point towards the direction of maximum increase in the density. You know, where is the dense, you know, set of points and as you see here it's pointing this, in this distribution this is a dense set. So it started here but it's pointing to us one and we'll keep going until we get the convergence where it won't move. So um, now this uh, mean we computed was equal weighted, that every point is equal weights. So better way to do is that we assign the weights to each point. And so this is, you know, WI is a weight and um, that will be uh, dependent on the distance from the initial location y0 to that point. And um, so we then apply the weight and we then define the average. And since we are applying the weights, so we'll sum up the weights and normalize by that as compared to normalize dividing by nx as we did. Okay? So then we again subtract from y0 and that is the mean shift. So here we have the nx the number of points in the kernel in the region of interest as we had before. Then we have y0, which is initial mean, and then we have the data points xi, and then we have radius, kernel radius, which is uh, shown here, h. Okay? So, um, so now, you know, these weights are determined, they are different kernels. And we'll talk about that, you know, uniform kernel, which means we'll assign these equal weights, as we did before. Uh, our Gaussian kernel or this uh, other Apache knockoff kernel from some Russian um, researcher. So now properties of mean shifts are that mean shift vector uh, has a direction of the gradient of density estimate. Okay, so um, that is important, and we are going to use that. Um, and it's computed iteratively, as I showed you in a. Um, 
animation and we will obtain the maximum density in the local neighborhood. So, um, so this process is actually a very good tool to find the modes or the peaks in a distribution. Okay, and um, this can be used for the probability density function. So, as you know, that you are, we have already talked about probability density function of like. Uh, Gaussian. So you can get uh, some population, some height of people in this room, and uh, you have these samples, and then you can fit a Gaussian, a bell curve to that. So that's a distribution. Uh, then, which means that I can find out what's the probability that um, <coughs> uh, somebody in this room has the height, say, uh, six feet, you know and somebody have you know five feet or something so as you know that if it's a bell-shaped curve then most of people will be the, at the mean the average and there are very few people who are very tall very few people will be very short so that's one distribution and then other distribution is a uniform distribution as we talked about say if you um, roll a die dice you know which is six possible outcome one to six then each um, face of the dice has equal probability. So there are, you know, equal uniform probability and so on. So there are many, many probability distributions or density functions. So uh, given this data, now what uh, we want to do and what is uh, mean shift is good for, that it helps us to um, analyze the distribution which is not parametric. So these distributions, the Gaussian, the uniform distribution, Poisson and exponential, there are lots and lots of distribution. These are parametric distribution because we can write a formula. We can have analytical expression and we can define the distribution by those parameters. For example, for Gaussian we have mean and the standard deviation, you know, and if it's multidimensional it's a covariance matrix. So uh, then becomes simple description of the density function. So once we have samples, we compute these parameters, then we can forget about samples. We don't have to have samples. Now the problem is that m many times the distribution is not Gaussian. So we cannot fit a Gaussian distribution to that samples, and uh, we will have problem. And, and first thing you can do is say, well, how about multiple Gaussian? That's why I can't mix it up Gaussians. You know? So not just one Gaussian, maybe, you know, use three Gaussians. So, you know, that sometimes helps you. But in some cases, actually, you know, even mix it up Gaussian doesn't fit the distribution. So therefore, there are these distribution which are called non-parameter distribution. And the idea there is simple that first is, you know, there's, there's no equation for the distribution. Second is essentially we will store all the samples we have. Okay, so the, the, the advantage of parameter distribution like Gaussian was that we don't have to store all samples once we have the parameters of distribution, the covariance matrix and the mean vector. But here we can model any arbitrary distribution but we have to basically store all the samples and that sometimes becomes a lot of data because if you have millions and millions of these samples then it become time consuming. So now we are going to look into that and say this is a data, there are lots of points in 2D and um, their distribution is like this. Even though it looks like Gaussian but in this, it's not a Gaussian. So what we are saying, this is X, this is Y, then we are saying what is the probability that uh, if I pick a randomly any point here, it will have this much x and y, which means a very high probability that most of the points have this value of x, y. Very low probability which will have this value of x and y, okay? So this is two-dimensional. So this uh, is the example of data set for which the distribution is like that. and. Uh, we want to show this, you know, use this idea of the mean shift and find out the gradient of this distribution 
and that we can do is using the mean shift. So essentially we will find the mode which is the peak in this distribution which is non-parametric distribution and that mode uh, will be corresponding to like a gradient of this distribution and that we can do this using this uh, mean shift process which is very simple. We start with some estimate, we find the mean, we shift it, find the mean, shift it and keep going and so on. So which is, which is pretty, pretty nice. Okay, so we will um, look into again more. Suppose this is our real data. So again we have points and f each point has value. This is x, this is y. This is x, this is y. So it's a two-dimensional thing. So um, given these points, now this may be its distribution. So again, you need to be very clear what we mean by distribution. You know, so so the simple example of distribution is a histogram. You know, you take an image. Say you have um, 10 by 10 image. You have 100 pixels, and each pixel has some value from 0 to 55. And you can get a distribution or a histogram. You can have these 256 bin and then every bin you say how many pixels in this 10 by 10 image are 0, how many pixels are 1, how many pixels are 2. So if you put these numbers that becomes histogram or uh, that is also a distribution for that particular image. Okay, So we're counting the pixels which has that particular value in that bin. Yes? Uh, that yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I think that if, if that initialization was in a circle, so the first circle mm -hmm. was distributed uniformly, yeah. so we will never get to the Yeah, so we are going to talk about that, you know, one initialization is not enough, so we are going to have many initialization, we are going to talk about that. Okay, so, so the distribution, you need to be very clear about what's the distribution. So that example of histogram I gave you, it's you know very simple distribution, um, and it's also a kind of non-parameter. We are not fitting some particular model like Gaussian and so on. So here and and there, it was one dimension because we are looking at the intensity value. Now here we have two dimension because we are looking at the x and y location of each of the points. Okay, so it's a two dim two D distribution, and so we have here x and y and then we have that wall. There will be a lots of these dots here which have around this value because that's what you have peak. There will be lots of some small number of dots here which have this value, this much x, this much y. And there's very small which has this value. So this is the actual, actual points but this is their distribution. Okay, so there are two different things, like an image and a histogram. There are two diff I mean, there, there are two different things, but they are related. That this histogram is of an image, and this distribution, which is shown here, is of this. But they are, they are representing different things. Okay, so this is representing where these points are. Then here we are counting how many points have this particular value. We add one to that. And we look at this one, say, well, this has this much value, we go here and add to that. So this is what they call bins, that's what they call how many numbers, and so on. So as you see here, that this um, number of points probably will correspond, so we have these three things, and maybe this correspond to these peaks. Because there are lots of them which correspond to here. This is another set correspond to here, and maybe very small here. So that is kind of mapping between a distribution and actual points. And we need to be very clear about that. So um, the data point density implies the PDF value. Okay. So, so that's another visualization that you know we can take a bunch of points and we have a height proportional to how many points we have there. So we have several up to the height there. We have fewer here and we have you know one or two here. So that's kind of reflects what the density is. And we can ha even have the, for each of the point, we can have, you know, that much uh, height for, for that 
and apply a weight and so on. So, um, so now in order to represent uh, this um, density uh, distribution, uh, we are going to use what is called the kernel density estimate. So this is the probability density function and uh, this will be in terms of the samples. So the samples are the u1, u2, u3 and so on. And this is as you see is a Gaussian and this is the will depend on the x. We want to find out what is the probability of x given particular value of x what's the probability that we can encounter in this distribution we can compute that that using this formula and we're just saying that um, we look at um, the distance of x from all sample points so we look at distance of x from u1 distance of x from mu2 mu3 and so on and proportional to distance from the x we are going to do the exponential and we'll add up all these basically finding the probability of particular x will be all the points will contribute and the contribution will depend how close they are to the x okay so that's what we have this distance and this is called the density estimation and uh, so we need to estimate these these things for this particular density estimation so now in this notion the important um, thing is this notion of kernel and so um, the as you saw before here you know we are having kind of Gaussian kernel here that this kernel will tell you that depending on distance from x to these data points how much weight I want to assign and here we do the exponentials like a Gaussian yes Yeah, I mean, data points, not really, you know, it's, it's saying, um, see, the, 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 it is a density function which represents a, a particular random variable. So it has these samples, and we are assuming that there is some density function. It's a one random variable. In, in this case, it's a vector, x1 and y1, and these are the samples of that. So these independence notion doesn't apply to this one because if you have two random variables, then you can look at it. But these all are samples of one distribution. Okay. So now, so we want to say, well, how we assign this weight? How do we assign this weight using these different kernels? So one is, as you saw, it's like a Gaussian. So this is called Gaussian kernel or normal kernel. So it'll depend on this distance you know, x squared and then exponential some constant. Then, and it looks like that, and you have seen this one. Then this is the uniform kernel that will apply uniform weight depending on, the, you know, whatever distance is, it's the same weight. So that's what's shown here, the constant C. Then other kernel is a, a Pechnikov kernel, which is a little different, which looks like that, which is, that's one minus x squared, you know, norm of that, when x is less than or equal to 1. So these are different kernels and there are lots of interesting you know, theory about that, but we want to get a flavor of what are these different ways we can apply the weights and uh, um, we will be using these as we proceed. Okay. So now there's another notion of this called profile. So we have a, you know, these radial, radially symmetric kernel, as you see, since we are using a norm here, so this is really symmetric, you know, x squared plus y squared, suppose in two dimension, it'll be, if they are in same distance, it'll be the same value, you know. So, um, so these are radially symmetrical um, kernels, and this thing is called a profile, okay? And um, so therefore, the probability density function, first we were representing this in, in general and using any kernel. So we take the data points x1 to x2 to xn and then we want to find our probability at particular x. So you find a distance from x to x1 
x to x2, x to x3, and that depending on the distance, we compute this weight, and we add it up, and that becomes a probability. And so now here, our kernel is expressed in terms of profile, which is you know x minus xi uh, square, and and that's the idea here. Okay. So now say this is our kernel density estimate for the non-parametric distribution. Uh, we essentially want to compute, given any x, we want to compute what's the probability. The way we are going to compute is that we have these samples, x1 to xn. These are, say, points, as I showed you. And we will find the distance from it, and then apply the kernel. We add it up, and contribution from all these. The points which will be very far from x, then they will have very small weight. Maybe they won't contribute, but we will add them up for all, and that's our probability. So it's a very simple way to represent density function, which is not parametric, that we don't know is a Gaussian or mixture of Gaussian or anything. But the problem is that we have to have these all n points. And many times there are millions of points. And that becomes a problem. So now a very interesting thing here is that this relationship of this uh, kernel density estimate with the mean shift. You know, because this lecture is about mean shift. So that's a very powerful result. And then we are going to show that how we can use this mean shift idea in tracking, and that's the whole point here. So now what we are going to do is we are going to differentiate this. We are finding a gradient or derivative of this probability, you know, and you are familiar with that. We apply the derivative on this side. We apply the derivative on that side. And uh, so since this is a square, you know, we will have two here, and this will become, you know, uh, we have the derivative of k will be k prime. Then we'll differentiate this because squared will become 2 and this thing. So this is the derivative of this, which is the gradient of density and which is expressed in terms of the, um, the kernel. And this is uh, k prime. And um, so given that, then we are going to um, um, use this notation that we are going to call this k prime as a g, just simplification. So we have, um, so from here, k prime is g of this, and this is x i minus x. And uh, then we are going to multiply this with x i minus multiply this with x. And this is what we are going to get. So this um, um, g of this multiplied with x i here minus then multiply by x. So we have these two terms here, and all these constants are there. So then we are going to simplify this further uh, to suit it to the mean shift. So from these two, we are going to take this term common from these both. We take this outside. So um, this will become x i g and this whole thing. And we divide by this. So um, that is one term from here. The second term, since we are taking this outside, so we'll just have x here. So from here, we got a x, which is minus x. From here, we write it down like this. And if I multiply this with again, I'll get this one. So now you start to see this thing here, which is shown again here, is actually it looks like a mean shift. Okay. Because we can say, again, represent this is a gi, an xi, gi minus x. And um, that is the mean shift. OK? Yeah, that's what we are doing. We take the data points, we assign the weights, sum them up, we divide by the weights. And this is the initial thing, subtract from that. And that's the process, which is very interesting. Because we took the density estimate, find the gradient, and then we ended up with the, this formula. And this is like this. This is our GI. And this is, um, this is our GI here. And this is the x. This whole thing is the mean shift. And that's the way we define mean shift. So GI and mean shift vector and the constant. On mean shift on this side, 
you bring in on that. So mean shift actually is the gradient of the probability density function in the non-parametric form, which is very nice. You know? so, so saying that the mean shift, the process we describe, that we start with something, we find the mean, we shift it, we shift it, shift, keep doing that, it's actually finding a gradient of the distribution of the points. And that's why it's finding a mode, it's finding a peak. So it's a very nice, you know, very nice result. And it's very simple that how we did that um, using this uh, <clears throat> process, intuitive idea about why we want to find the mean and we find the iterative fashion, we start some initial estimate, we look at the region and keep shifting, keep shifting until we cannot shift. And then we introduce this distribution, kernel density estimate, and uh, then we find a gradient of that and the whole process we came up with like that. So that's very nice. So which means that uh, we want to, we can detect the, the modes of this distribution um, by finding the, applying the mean shift process on this, okay? Now it can happen um, that, you know, sometime it can get stuck in the saddle points. So that's what this question Madhi was asking. And um, so what we are going to do, we'll perturb this. We'll make a little change so that we cannot get stuck in those. And um, so the scheme will be that we'll find all modes using simple mean shift procedure. Then we'll prune those um, by perturbing them. We'll make some little changes. And then we'll, we'll um, uh, prune nearby ones and we'll take the, um, the highest mode in the window. So I'm going to show you an example. So, so the properties are that we can find the automatic convergence of mean shift. Um, um, it depends on the size and gradient. And we can you know, do the near maxima. Uh, and when we get the near maxima, the steps will be small, small and refined. And, um, and there's a proof that this convergence is guaranteed, that it's, it's going to you know, happen and especially for the uniform kernel uh, and convergence achieving the finite number of steps and normal kernel, you know, we can have a, a smooth trajectory, but it's slower than uniform. So, so again, let's look at uh, this model analysis. So we have again these points and we want to find out a region which is very dense. And so we are not going to start with just one. So simultaneously, we're going to start many different places this mean shift process. So these are the initial estimate of the mean. So then um, they, we, will, we will have this process and hopefully they will convert to the right region where we have a dance. So even if the, some of these get stuck in the, in the thing, but we'll have most of them will convert to the uh, the right place where we have the dense region. Okay, so um, so in this particular case, uh, these one the only one which did not converge here, but all other ones converge here using this mean shift process, which is you know which is nice. Um, so then now the main thing, given the mean shift, you know this very simple intuitive idea. Now you want to look at how we can use main shift to solve the tracking problem. That's where we started, okay? So the general framework is that we have a target, you know, which we want to track, and uh, we have its representation, you know, some, some intensity values, some color values, which we want to look at, and shown this is our target, which we want to track, and we look at a small window around it, and we, uh, compute some features, and these features can be intensity, the gradient, the color, and so on. And then um, we want to um, come up with a dis distribution, a PDF. That's where we are going to apply this mean shift idea. So we'll compute features, and it can be simple intensity values or color. We'll get a histogram of that. 
and that becomes like a PDF. So um, then we will have the target uh, localization tracking. So you know, said so this is the first frame we have. We know uh, where the target is. We'll look at the uh, region of interest, um, and then we want to go to the next frame, and uh, we will find the probability density function of this one and probability density function of this one and see if this is the same target then they will have a similar probability density functions or similar histograms and that's what we are going to do okay so we have a current frame and say this is the histogram of that you know we have different bins suppose we have m bins and tells you how many pixels in this target we have for this pin and this pin, this pin, and this ripple. And we are going to represent that by Q hat. So that's a distribution or a histogram, so a probability density function, PDF, of this, this target, okay, which is shown here, which is, you know, we have different bins, and uh, there will be Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, and so on, up to QM. Uh, and similarly, we have um, next frame, and which has the histogram like this, and um, the uh, these are the different bins for here. Again, M bins, and they are different, a little different than this one. Where this is a different image, and since these are probabilities, so we'll make sure that when we sum up all these bins, there should be one, and also this should be one. So we have these two probability density functions. Uh, PDFs for the target and the one current frame you know, and say it's the same target okay so we want to look at similarity of these two PDFs you know how similar these two distributions are and uh, the way we are going to do is using this famous um, um, Patacharya coefficient where you can compare two distributions so um, this distribution since it's a vector, so we basically will find out the dot product of these two vectors. And when you find the dot product of these two vectors, you are basically looking at the angle between these two vectors, cosine of this angle between two vectors. And um, that's what we are going to do. Okay? And um, so the what will this... Um, amount to that this function which will be maximum when these two distributions are similar we will have to find out where this function is maximum where what's the mode of this function and the way we are going to find the mode of this function will apply mean shift process that's where we are going to do that okay so so we have a target and this model we'll use either gray level or color, any, any gradient features and so on. And then the, we'll have distributions of those features. And we will get a histogram, there'll be a weighted histogram as we talked about. Um, and uh, we are going to use the weights using this kernels, which, which I showed you before. So here is the uh, more concrete example of how we are going to find the distribution. So let's say target is around here, and um, then we are going to look at you know this is our like um, <coughs> center. Then we are going to look at the and we have different bins. Okay, so we are going to look at you know what is the probability of what's the value of bin at u. So we will go through this target and find out what pixels have the value u, that particular pin. So we found out this pixel, this pixel, this pixel have same value. Okay? And uh, we'll find our distance f to each of this pixel from the center. And that will be computed from this um, kernel or the weight. So then we are essentially going to add those and this is the representation of that. There's a delta function. Uh, delta function is uh, one 
when this u is, is equal to that intensity value at that xr. So if they are equal, then this will become 1, and we will add up these distances, and that will become probability of at u. And when the, they are, this is not u, these intensity values are not u for other pixels, we are not going to add those. And we'll take another value of u. Again, we'll go through this and find which pixels have u value. We find those pixels, find the distances, add them up, and do that. And this is the way we are going to generate this probability density function, which is weighted histogram, essentially, for the target. And similarly, we are going to generate for the, um, the, um, the candidate um, in the current frame. And uh, this we will call, one of them will be P, other will be called Q. So when we plot it in this P, you maybe look like that. But this is the discrete version, the way we are going to compute for every bin. Suppose we have M bins, so we'll compute P of 1, P of 2, P of 3, and P of M will be values. So here's an example that if you take an image, this is histogram of the image. But if these are the target, this is another one target, this is another target, then we are going to compute the weighted histogram of the image depending on those distances and the kernel. And this can be the distribution of this target, this can be a second target, and this can be a background, which is non-target. Okay? So now we are going to look at the similarity of target distribution and the candidate distribution, because that's where we can do a tracking. Because we have a target here, we are on our next frame, so is it similar? And how do you find similar? If their distributions are similar, or if their histograms are similar, or the distance between these distributions is small. So that's the idea. So we have a target, which we represent by Q, U, and we have a candidate, which will represent by P, H, U. These are the distributions. And we are going to look at this distance between them, which will be minus 1 minus rho Y, and rho Y will be the essentially the dot product of, of the multiplication of these two distribution bin by bin. So because this is a vector, so we'll find the value for u is equal to 1, multiply p u, uh, p1, y, and q1, and then take next value of u, and so on. We'll get this row, and that determine how similar they are. 1 minus rho is similar how, you know, dissimilar they are, distance. So this thing is called Bhattacharya coefficient, which is uh, the researcher in India, he came up with this idea of two distribution. We can find, finding this, uh, taking the histograms and bin by bin multiplication of that. Okay, so we want to minimize the distance. When the distance between two distributions is minimized, then they are similar or we want to maximize the Bhattacharya coefficient because it is 1 minus rho. So we are going to do maximize the Bhattacharya coefficient, which is here. OK? And uh, so th don't get be scared because this is a very simple thing. You have a histogram, you have bin, you're multiplying the values bin by bin. That's it. That, that's what this is. There's nothing, nothing fancy about it. Okay, so again here you will see we are going to use a Taylor series, you know. So we are going to use a Taylor series of this, and that will be around p hat y of zero because that's the initial estimate of the target where that is, and that will become like that. We'll only use a first order Taylor series. So this is the value of function at where we want to estimate the Taylor series, and this is the derivative. Um, because as you see it's under root, so we have 1 upon 2 and this whole thing will become minus 1 upon 2 and um, then we'll find the derivative within that and that's why we are going to get this thing here and of course we'll have p hat y of 0 here because Taylor series is derivative and the actual value where we want to compute. So this is a Taylor series of this at here which is in terms of again p and Q, now this is the P hat or tilde uh, P hat at particular value Y0. And this is a general P hat at any Y. 
okay and uh, so this is for the target queue so we have we want to maximize this maximize this we find a telesis like this and uh, then essentially when we want to maximize we want to maximize this blue term because that's what um, matters you know, this is kind of constant okay so we have the same thing here and uh, <clears throat> So you want to maximize this term. Now we are going to go back and we say what is the definition of this uh, kernel density estimate which we define in terms of the uh, u and the value of that each xi point in the image. You know, remember I showed you here that how to compute um, this thing here. So we are going to use this thing. This is the definition how we computed the kernel density estimate for this p looking at different values of bins and looking at if that pixels have this is a value of the image at that pixel this is a, this is a color or the intensity so so the, this is the same formula we're going to put that instead of p which we showed here so instead of p hat ui we put that thing and this is the same and then we are going to use this was a kernel so we're going to use this kernel here okay so now we have this is the thing we want to maximize so we do that and um, and so what it means that it depends on we are going to call this uh, wi okay and these we'll call the weights so again we have the normalization constant these are the gray level at x and this is a kernel center and number of bins and we have been talking about that so um, so we want to maximize these weights and um, how do we do that we are going to apply the mean shift so mean shift process as you saw is that we want to find the center of these points with weighted and then we have initial estimate and we keep doing that thing so what we are going to do that these weights we computed we are going to use the weights here and apply mean shift and uh, that's it so this essentially is telling us that we want to find out the the where the target is depending on the contribution of each of the pixel in the window and each of the pixel is represented by xi so we have lots of pixel in the window and each has a contribution which depends on this weight and that depends on the distribution of the target and candidate and how much that pixel is contributing what is its color or intensity value depending on that okay so then that's it so we have a method we can find the next location of the target in the frame by applying the mean shift process which is the standard mean shift process the only difference is that the weights are determined using this which has these distributions and they involve the contribution of each pixels and these are weighted by the contribution of each pixel and the saying that I look at a pixel look at its color if it belongs to a particular bin u then this contributes that and then we look at the, uh, the value of that bin from the target and from the candidate and we sum them up we apply the weight we go to the next pixel again we do the same process and so on so then that give me an estimate of the target and and that's it so the algorithm is we will calculate the q which is a weighted histogram of the of the target which is you know instead of histogram it's just weighted depending on the distances of these point depending on cul and, uh, kernel and then we have initial estimate which is uh, y0 and then we go to the candidate you know calculate p we calculate the weights and we compute using mean shift the next estimate y1 and we look at say is it is the difference the we are looking at these distribution difference is small enough then we stop otherwise not small enough we keep going that as i showed you the iteration and then we get center that's it so you essentially can write this program just looking at this flowchart 
and you, you basically have the mean shift tracker. And if you do that, then you can basically do this, that you can keep tracking the target using this. And it is just looking at the distribution of the, here is intensity, there's no color, and um, finding this thing, the next location in iterative fashion, uh, finding this vector, how much you want to shift, how much you want to shift, and you know, keep doing that. And the shift depends on this contribution of each pixel and the what's the target and what is the uh, candidate. And there are lots of results. And this is because this is a very popular method. Um, and this I already showed you. Uh, let's look at this one. So this is actually very interesting. So there's just just ball moving and you know you can keep tracking using that. And I, actually it can track for a long time. I mean this in a very simple case because the you know, ball is pretty visible, it's a very red, it's very different from the background. So it you know it, it works pretty well. Um, so again, the features are important here that, uh, you know, what you um, use. So is this done? Okay. Let's look at this one. Similar, I think. Here yeah, the background is a little different. The ball is small. So here you can use a color histogram. So you look RGB and you'll have more bins. Now the, the first set of results I showed you where we have uh, flare images, the infrared, you know, there we don't have color, it's just intensity. So there we use the uh, gradient of intensity and you know, some other features to um, do that, otherwise it um, will not work. So yeah, here it lasted, then I think the initialize again. And that's why you have a green track, and then you have the red track. Okay, so um, this is the tracking of fish. So we are showing this track using the green track. It's pretty complicated. <coughs> It's not stable, but at least it's always on the person. Okay, so they, these are the references. They had a paper, you know, first in the CVPR conference, then they had a journal paper, and this paper actually got the best paper award. I remember this conference was Hilton Head, South Carolina, and um, this has about 5,000 citations. So, um, so that's it. How does the mean shift deal with the uh, like scale? Like if you have an object mm -hmm. and you're tracking it, like yeah. it starts taking up a large portion of the image or a small portion of the image. Yeah. So, so one way to deal with is that you know you want to change this area of region of interest as we were doing. So there's a whole notion of what should be that region of interest. And that's also called bandwidth. So um, then you want to try these uh, different regions of interest, you know, and that way you can deal with the scale. Is there like any way to, like within the algorithm, to update the size of the region, or is it just you, as you're like testing the? the yeah, you can, you can, you can, you can try different, uh, different um, bandwidths, and there, there, may be the ways to you can determine what should be the automatic uh, weight, what should be the bandwidth, you know, what should be the region of interest. So there's actually follow-up work after that. People have uh, looked into that to deal with the scale issue. Any other question? Yeah. Given the application of this method and mm -hmm. topography, yeah. where we are actually analyzing the intensity values of color levels, mm -hmm. so 
wouldn't be having different players having wearing the same color dress. Yeah. So how we are going to distinguish specifically between the players? No, I mean, if they are wearing different colors, then it's easy. But if they are wearing same colors, then it's hard. A team of single team is wearing a single dress. Yeah, same color, then be a problem. Yeah, yeah. So that's why see the tracking in um, in the soccer uh, will be hard because the people look the similar. So you are using only color color information. So it will it will not it will fail many times. Yeah. Two players will wear the same color and pass each other as a possible. Yeah, yeah, because see that, so right now we have talked about just single object tracking, you know. So, um, and ideally it works pretty well if there's a single target as you saw here, you know. So we have just ball, you just keep tracking. There's no occlusion, there are no other objects, and so on. So it works pretty well. But in real life, versus you'll have occlusion. You'll have other people will go behind it. Uh, other thing is that you will tr you need to track multiple objects together. So you will have to do something on the top of this that you will do the mean shift on these each object. And when you have problem, you have to resolve. So it's called multiple object tracking. But this is more more suitable for just tracking a single object. Okay, more, more questions? Yeah, go ahead. I'm usually uh, in important games, uh, when, when a player is going out from the field, let's say in soccer, mm -hmm. they end up by, uh, the, let's say, this guy has run about 8 kilometers. Mm -hmm. So do they use something like this to find, uh, the, because if you can keep, take the track of the movement mm -hmm. of that guy yeah. during the period of his in the field, yeah. so Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah I mean so see the 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 point is that if you can track players you can do lots of things including you can say how much you know how many miles how, how many uh, feet somebody has covered and and so on it's all these things are possible so of course there you have to do some kind of calibration some kind of conversion from the pixels to meters and feet um, and uh, <clears throat> the depending on where the camera is, there will be, you know, distortion and so on. But yeah, I mean, you can do lots of things. But but the tracking in these kind of um, you know examples, it is still is not not that easy. Suppose you know you you don't have anything working uh, where you can track every player automatically. You know, uh, still it's a pretty hard problem because of these videos you get um, from say broadcast you know the sports broadcast then there's a lot of camera motion you know cameras move, moving zooming in so on there are lots of many many people so it still is a, is a difficult problem okay more more questions Yeah, go ahead. Anybody? Yes. So this is the algorithms. So let's see who is brave to implement this thing. So it's pretty simple. So you, know, you take a video and take a window. That's what you want to track. Get a histogram, get weighted histogram, and compute this uh, weights using this um, formula here and put in this mean shift, you are done. So this is a very different way to do tracking. Okay? So if you compare, you had a question? So you compare this with uh, KLT. No? KLT was finding the um, transformation, the geometric transformation from one frame to other frame in terms of the, um, you know, displacement, uh, rotation, translation, affine, and so on. And uh, <coughs> then applying the brightness constancy assumption that while the intensity here and here is similar, 
So you want to minimize the difference, you want to find these parameters. And we went through again our Taylor series and came up with maximizing or minimizing some some function. We have to differentiate it and get the change in parameter. It was an iterative fashion and so on. Now this is very different in a way that is looking at the distribution and saying, well, these two distributions should be similar. And then it's using the notion of that you have some distribution and what's the best way to find the modes, the peaks, where you will find the maxima. And then using this mean shift idea that you can find these modes or the dense region by applying this mean computing, starting with some estimate of mean, finding the mean, shifting that, shifting that, shifting that, and you get the mode where you have maximum dense area. So all this is, you know, very mathematical, it's very intuitive, and actually it works. So that's, you know, that's very, very nice uh, thing.